My name is Lisa Lowe, and I'm a professor in American Studies and Ethnicity, Race, and Migration. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to thank Stephen Pitty, Matthew Tanico, and Nicole Edwards at the RITM, whose support and assistance have made uh, the organization of this series uh, possible. Our speaker, Jody Malamud, is Associate Professor of English and African American Stu uh, Africana Studies at Marquette University. She's the author of Represent and Destroy, Rationalizing Violence in the New Racial Capitalism, published in 2011. And she's published many articles and chapters in a wide array of journals and editions. In Represent and Destroy, she analyzes the shifts in the governance of race through racial liberalism of the 1940s to 60s, liberal multiculturalism of the 1980s to 90s, and neoliberal multiculturalism from the 2000s to the present, but of course, uh, paradigmatically, the Obama era. She considers how successive regimes of official anti-racism employ racial inclusiveness and incorporated anti-racist terms of value in order to limit the radical dissent that by black, indigenous, and immigrant groups and to manage and administer race within the nation, as well as to facilitate the expansion of capitalism globally. Since representation and uh, represent and destroy, she continues to be concerned with analyzing the processes through which the administration of race translates the world into terms that are conducive to capitalism and permits, permits the in intensification of racialized accumulation and dispossession, both in the US and globally. In the introduction to the recent volume of social text titled Economies of Dispossession, um, the introduction, Predatory Value, Economies of Dispossession and Disturbed Relationalities, Malamud with co-authors Jody Bird, Alyosha Goldstein, and Chindan Reddy offers Economies of Dispossession as a rich analytic that permits us to understand multiple historical and ongoing processes of racial subjection, colonial occupation, extraction and appropriation. In a recent piece, Using Liberal Rights to Enforce Racial Capitalism, Malamud with co-author Chandan Reddy discuss how neoliberal racial capitalism repurposes liberal rights and operates through administration. They specify how rights racialize and differentiate the valued and devalued, not only through the withholding of rights, but through the granting of them as well. Violent exclusion from national belonging has characterized the historical emergence of the United States from its beginnings. It justified the destruction and dispossession of indigenous peoples, the enslavement of Africans and Jim Crow segregation, the stolen labors of indentured peoples and immigrant workers, and the losses of life as the US waged wars in Latin America, East, Northeast, and Southeast Asia, Central Asia, and the Middle East. Yet violence accompanies not only exclusion from the nation, but inclusion into it as well. As emancipated slave, indebted poor, grateful immigrant laborer, rehabilitated inmate. The violence of inclusion, an operation that proposes to convert subjugated others into normative multicultural citizens, is also a process of racial governance, which interests Jody Malamud. More regulation and administration of individual rights and personal responsibility provides a tighter weed for elevating the privileged from the stigmatized, tracking the property and the impoverished, sorting the productive from the disposable. Her current book in progress, Dispossession by Administration, from which she, she will speak today, elaborates the problem of administrative power and investigates its diffuse and deadly capacities to give impunity to racial capitalist violence through seemingly neutral operations of democratic, procedural, and technical governance. Please join me in welcoming <laughs> Professor Jody Malamed, whose lecture today is titled Operationalizing Racial Capitalism, Administrative Power, and Ordinary Violence. Thank you. Uh. Wow, thank you so much for that just generous and comprehensive and canny introduction, which reminds me of the debt of all the thinking I owe to uh, Professor Lowe's amazing canon of work. 
How are you guys doing this afternoon? It's great to see you all. Um, I am really happy and honored here to be here with you. It's been great these last two days or so. Great and great, I guess, right? Uh, these last two days or so being part of the Communities of Thinking. I'm really grateful for all the graduate students who've come and spoken with me. I'm grateful for everyone who's hosted me. Nicole, thank you for all the work that you did to bring me here. Um, it's been wonderful. And I kind of want to cite and think a little bit more about our collectives of thinking together by just calling out by name some of the people here at Yale whose work and selves I've learned so much from more than I can uh, actually say, including Professor Lowe, Rod Ferguson, Matthew Jacobson, Daniel Hosang, Hazel Carby, Daphne Brooks, and Ned Blackhawk. And though he's not officially at Yale, you've already heard his name several times today. Uh, Chandan Reddy, my generous and brilliant 20 plus years collaborator, is right here. Um, and I'm hoping that he will take over a Q&A, so maybe you'll hear a bit more from him later. Um, I also give gratitude and respect to this land, this long water land, and the people to whom it is kin, especially the Ian Scottombeg or Quinnipiac. I thank my Mohican friends in Indian country, Wisconsin, for helping me to see this land as the homeland of their relatives relations with whom were formed in order to kind of safeguard survival before mutual removal to what is now Wisconsin. Um, can you guys hear me okay? I'm kind of trying to project, but I'm on sabbatical, so I've been out of the classroom a little bit. Um, but I, I just want to finally thank each and every one of you coming out despite the rain, despite the fact that it's Halloween, with the ordinary overwork and emergencies to really hear and think with me about some of my sabbatical freedom dreams. You guys are getting things like uh, right off the top of my fever dreams, freedom dreams, I don't know what they are, but you're getting stuff right off the top of my head. Uh, so I'll be really excited to get feedback from you. And I hope I can give you something you can use right now because I do think it's important right now to think about administrative power as an operationalizing power for racial capitalism, I'll be explaining that, and how this transactability enforcing power, which I'll be talking about is actually irreducible in so-called democratic, democratic capitalist states and is insulated by design, how at this moment it is being used by the Trump administration and the post-Citizens United semi-privatized Republican Party to further decapacitate the already hollowed out neoliberal administrative state and to weaponize it for a formation that critical sociologists are calling a term I like and don't like, we'll talk about it more, what critical sociologists are calling authoritarian neoliberalism, which in the US under Trump I'll talk about as governance by deal. So first to riff more generally, I want to think about an administrative power that is about enforcing forms of appearance for tr transactability along within and constituting circuits of capital accumulation. I think of administrative power as a how of capitalism, a power of encasement, partition, abstraction, and modularity that seeks to format all constituents of social process from human beings to value making to nature for what Marx called the capital relation, right? Which is not one relation, but shifting and variegated and multiple capitalist relations sedimented for the moment or momentarily out of a base, a moving base of competition between capitalist blocks and what resists them and what evades them. Administrative power whitewashes the violence produced by and for capitalist relations so that the brutality of racial and colonial capitalisms appears normal, necessary if regrettable, sometimes even appears as just dem democracy or democratic process in action. And to just throw out a few quick examples, uh, I'm gonna be riffing here off of the Reverend Dr. William Barber II, who's the head of, uh, one of the co-chairs of the Poor People's Campaign. He was head of the NAACP in North Carolina for a while. He's a great thinker of policy violence. So riffing with him, the decision of state legislators not to expand Medicare isn't let die violence, it's just health policy. Immigration officers raiding homes and snatching children from bus stops isn't violence, it's just the normal defense of US democracy. Mass criminalization, underemployment, and debt economies in black and brown neighborhoods aren't seen as administrated precarity by design by the state, but just public policy issues, right? Police killing itself is immune to punishment if the state judges that proper procedures were followed. 
So here's the crux of administrative power thought about more theoretically that I will unpack through the crux of the talk. And that is that administrative power plays on the double, doubleness that liberalism is always, as we learned so powerfully in Professor Lowe's work, at once classic liberalism, so economic and social uh, and political philosophy, and a theory and practice of racial and colonial management that works by constituting and sorting legitimacy and illegitimacy to groups of human beings who are different, differently situated in hegemonic state capital relations so that, for example, whiteness endures as a marker identity for being able to exercise the capacity to possess and stands in counterpoint to blackness and indigeneity as social markers for dispossessability. Administrative power is a process power, and in the doing power, frankly, even more an it gets done power. It can be a make-do power, too. Its hallmark is a kind of recursivity where a constituted or instituted domination or hegemony interprets and legitimates its own violent constituting conditions as democratic, right, fair, and inevitable, however killing or criminal they were and are, and then applies these made right conditions to predispose the future, a recursivity connected to the force of the realization of materialized circulations of capital accumulation, easier said, connected to making facts on the ground, the power of what it is to make facts on the ground. Uh, in other words, it's a, or another way to think about it is as a combined kind of state, police, policy, and capital power that appears to be none of the above because the doing that it does is precisely unthinkable within liberal thought. Liberal thought relies on distinctions between civil society, state, policing, and the free market, and on the idea that law directs state action rather than state capitalist force determining outcomes first based on structuring conditions of domination, then assembling legal justification and jurisdiction for further reproduction ex post facto, something I'll talk about in a minute as the law, I need to say it like dash, law dash administration dash force continuum. To think administrative power, we must break with the fetish today of both liberal and white right, right wing political discourse for the separation of powers, right? You guys hear about separation of powers every time you look at a newspaper or listen to a podcast, right? Because administrative power, uh, you can't see it if you think separation of powers is what is going on or what should be going on, right? Uh, it exercises a power that is at once legislative, adjudicating, and executive, which tries and often happily fails to arrange things so that day to day, without it being politicized, the empirical accumulative ends of reigning dominant capitalist classes are met by hook or by crook. Historically, misrecognizing this has been important for building consensus for so-called democratic capitalism in the US and making it look democratic. So this use of something that looks like democratic proceduralism or mere administration or technical efficiency to encase and insulate core racial capitalist circulations from democracy as people power is an enduring feature of US society from the beginning, right? But it has a particular genealogy through the development of the administrative state, which was inaugurated in the progressive era uh, and in the New Deal administration where new capacities for the state to uh, contest capitalist exploitation for white citizens, right, came side by side with the building in of sort of administrated social Darwinism. It was contested in revision through the long civil rights period as the carceral civil rights state, to quote Naomi Murakawa, repressively incorporated elements of social movement struggles as it built in new administrative punitive capacities. And then the Reagan era institutes uh, the neoliberal state, the hollowing out of administrative capacities to safeguard and redistribute um, while growing uh, the state's administrative capacity to facilitate corporate capital maximization. But my focus today will be on, I think, the next stage, right? So this is the theory, tell me what you think. Um, the form administrative paper is, uh, power is taking right now within the US racial settler capitalist anti-state state in this period that social scientists are increasingly calling authoritarian neoliberalism. So Ian Bruff used that term in a 2014 article to describe the emergence of a neoliberalism, quote, rooted in the reconfiguring of the state into a less democratic entity through constitutional and legal challenges that seek to insulate it from political conflict. And that was in 2014. 
In his 2017 edited collection, States of Discipline, Samal Birak Tanzel similarly argued that even though the use of the state to shield capital accumulation is not new, and it's not like neoliberalism in general has been an exclusively consensual process, nonetheless, there's been a change in the everyday ordinary, uh, ordinariness, right, of the ordinary practices of uh, capitalist states, enough of a qualitative shift in their normal operations that we can talk about authoritarian neoliberalisms as one, operating through a preemptive discipline, which simultaneously insulates neoliberal policies through a set of administrative, legal, and coercive mechanisms, and limits popular resistance against neoliberalism, and two, are marked by significant escalation in the state's propensity to employ coercion and legal slash extra legal intimidation. So interestingly, both critical sociologists who want to warn us about it and those right-wing academic and legal scholars who want to keep building it up date this authoritarian neoliber neoliberalism to the same time, uh, which is basically to the 2008 global financial crisis and the mobilization of state power to save and thereby further the continued dominance of finance-driven accumulation. Indeed, under Trump, the checks and balances that Obama kind of tried to put in um, have been removed, like the fiduciary rule was rolled back. The Consumer Finance Protection Bureau has been all but undone, and then it's also been souped up, right? So we've got a tax code that privileges uh, financialized forms of capitalism. And just recently, I think a couple weeks ago, he, he decided to make the very extraordinary move of doing exactly what was done in the time of the financial crisis, but just doing it basically to like, keep the stock market up, which is selling enormous amounts, having the Federal Reserve buy enormous amounts of treasury debt, right? Um, Scholars distinguish between a rollback period of neoliberalism, where state focus was on deregulation, privatization, and kind of getting out of the way of corporate finance and tech economies, and this roll out, use the state period, where hollowed out state capacity is now weaponized to benefit increasingly interlocking and administrated logistical, financial, and extractive global capitalisms. So clearly from the point of view of critical race and ethnic studies scholars, um, uh, indigenous critical theory, queer of color critique, and all these other social uh, movement connected interdisciplines, it's interesting that the sociologists don't mention words or concepts like colonialism or imperialism or white nationalism. Um, and indeed, they, they tend to defend a once existing better democracy, so we see that they kind of miss the side of liberalism that's racial and colonial management and sexual management as well, right? But most importantly, they miss what these analytics can tell us about the weakness of administrative heavy exercises of power. Because administration at the end, even though it's also like a make do, get it done power, it's like get it done as if. It's still an as if power, right? It's about controlling forms of appearance of administration so a transaction can happen, it can be killing and violent, but there's always more going on, right? There's always alternate modes of collectivity, other social worlds continue, and collectivities of solidarities uh, themselves that are building everywhere, we'll talk about some of those at the end, uh, those themselves jam up accumulations, circuits, and interoperabilities. For my purpose, it's important that authoritarian neoliberalism entails a shift, as Chandan Reddy puts it, from law, uh, rule by lawmaking to rule by rulemaking, even though they're not completely different. Um, Pages stuck together by the humidity, sorry. <laughs> so, so, okay, on the one hand, it's true that neoliber neoliberalism has always been about administrated orders. As Quinn Slobodian tells us, neoliberalism is not about freedom and free things happening in the market regulating itself. It's a practice of global ordering, regulatory systems, and institutions that seek to protectively encase the world economy from democratic pressures. But as Saskia Sassen, Deborah Cowan, and others note, we are witnessing unprecedented successful administrative post-national encasements of flows of capital through global institutions, rulemaking, standardization, and punitive enforcement, from the securitization of supply lines, to World Trade Organization law, to globally networked financial exchanges, and there can be many, many, many other um, examples, right? In fact, they're, they're, they're marked by opportunistic assemblages of business investment and governance, 
which organize accumulation by articulating rules as lowly as municipal zoning rules and as lofty as sort of big global or regional economic alliances like the European Union or the Gulf Cooperation Council. So tonight I'll focus on how the Trump administration uses administrative power to weaponize the neoliberalized administrative state for governance by deal. Using administrative power as a policing power increasingly turned on the administrative state itself to put it under executive control and make it pliable to deal making. I will also discuss policing itself as a fundamentally administrative power, the power to fabricate, operationalize, and regulate social order and abolish disorder to the point of killing. And think about new modes of policing uh, emerging in line with authoritarian neoliberal governance. So if broken windows policing has been our go-to term for policing that accompanies that roll back the state phase of neoliberalism, we might want to think of another term for the policing that is happening during this roll out phase of authoritarian neoliberalism with state uh, coercive capacity expanding in the name of interoperability and threat management beyond conventional public-private, police-military, and domestic transnational distinctions. And I'm kind of in the larger work playing with two terms. One is interoperability policing, and the other is uh, adapting from Shannon Speed, neoliberal multi-criminalization. So any feedback on that, very grateful for it. Um, so briefly, though, to think a little bit more about the distinctiveness of liberal admi administrative power in racial colonial capitalist modernity, I want to turn to a passage from the beginning of Marx Capital One, Section 8, so-called primitive or original accumulation. Has anybody heard of it? All right, it's like everybody's talking about this right now, and here I am, I'm talking about it too. And I'm even gonna say, because people are like, well, we don't like primitive accumulation, we like original better, and I'm like, well, I don't like either one. I don't like primitive or original. I like originary, but actually what I wanna do is uh, break down the German a little bit. So in German, the phrase is ursprünglich Accumulation, right? And so ursprünglich ur means like source. It means like the originary point. Sprunglich means like to spring from or to jump from, right? So I, I like to think of it as um, this part of capital is asking us to analyze the recurring sort of jumping off points or jumping off sources for circuits of capital accumulation, right? Capital moving around, which is never a one-time thing uh, and never the inevitable outcome of past arrangements, but it has to keep jumping off again and again as capital circulates along with its constitutive and constituting violence at all times and also at these world historic levering changes in uh, world historic capitalist configurations. So Marx writes this section, uh, the very first section of that, uh, this is the so-called primitive accumulation uh, chapter at the very beginning of section eight, and he writes it as a kind of historical materialist prehistory of the transition um, from feudalism to industrial capitalism in England, right? That whole sort of part. It's like he's suddenly become a historian, right? Um, but it actually all begins with Marx making fun of the prehistory endeavor, and that's the passage I wanna uh, focus on, on how he makes fun of how liberal political economists use the same fairy tale of origins again and again to justify property, wealth, and poverty. And I'm going to read that passage a little, little, little idiosyncr idiosyncratically, that's a hard word to say, um, as Marx actually continuing to do what he has done throughout capital, so not turning historian, but continuing to unmask hows of capitalism, right? So at this, at this point in the text in Capital One, he's unmasked the commodity form, he's unmasked wage labor, he's unmasked the working day, and I think now he's unmasking the how of how capital accumulation maintains the appearance of being systemic, continuous, internally coherent, cumulative through time, and fundamentally economic, despite its constant reliance on social and political violence, the precarity it produces for most, which makes it inherently insecure, right, and the crisis tendencies of circulatory accumulation itself. I read the functionally operable non-explanation of what Marx presents to us as a fairy tale of the just origins of wealth, told whenever the question of property is at stake, as illuminating administrative power, as both substantial and empty and open secret, undisclosed at gunpoint. All right, so I'll try to read this in a bit of a fairy tale way. If it's super annoying that I'm reading it in a fairy tale way, I apologize in advance, but um, it's sort of written that way. So here, here's the passage. Primitive accumulation plays approximately the same role in political economy as original sin does in theology. Adam bit an apple, and thereupon sin fell on the human race. 
Its origin is supposed to be explained when it is told as an anecdote about the past. Long, long ago, there were two sorts of people. One, the diligent, intelligent, and above all, frugal elite. The other, lazy rascals, spending their substance and more in riotous living. Thus it came to pass that the former sort accumulated wealth and the latter sort finally had nothing to sell but their own skins. And from this original sin dates the poverty of the great majority who despite all their labor have up to now nothing to sell but themselves and the wealth of the few that increases constantly, although they have long since ceased to work. Such insipid childishness is every day preached to us in defense of property. As soon as the question of property is at stake, it becomes a sacred duty to proclaim the standpoint of the nursery tale as the one thing fit for all age groups and all stages of development. In actual history, as is well known, conquest, enslavement, robber, robbery, murder, in short, force play the greatest role. Right and hard work were forever the sole means of enrichment, naturally with the exception each time of this year. So I'm drawn to this passage in the first place because I see it as a what I think of as a trace of the trick of racialization in the text of Marx, right? It's, got, it's a fairy tale about capitalism's original diversity, the frugal elite and the lazy rascals, the producers and the parasites, right? Uh, to quote uh, Daniel Hosang and Joseph Laund Laundes. Um, and it's easily transposable to what racism does for capitalism, which is to legitimate the inequality capitalism requires to create fictions of differential human worthiness and unworthiness, of legitimacy and illegitimacy, and to use these to fix and justify exploitative relations between social groups. So the fairy tale of race as a technology for sorting human beings is an administrative procedure for racial capitalism. Uh, but as we see from the passage, so is property, so is virtue, so is right. And all of these knowledge power categories central to liberalism act as administrative anchors in tandem to whitewash capitalist making, capitalist preserving violence. I read that last recursive part of the passage where it is well known that conquest, enslavement, robbery, murder, and short force play the greatest role in, Ruther, in wealth accumulation, but right and hard work forever appear unconvincingly as the sole source of enrichment, as telling us something about the work liberal administration does along a law-administration-force continuum to relentlessly convert violence into transactability for capitalism. So according to liberalism, universal laws are made consensually, they are neutrally administered, and when necessary, where there is law breaking, force is used to restore law and maintain order. Yet this passage tells us that something really different is happening along that law-administration-force continuum. From this perspective, accumulation is operationalized through force, then made to appear not merely legal, but a neutral managerial outcome recursively. Administration does not apply, but handles law and predisposes future now legitimate use of force. So rather than the non-political link between law and force, administrative powers very political work is to, in an instant, adjudicate capitalism's foreground and background violence in action that is making the capital relation, interpret or make law to accord with these actions, and then recode capitalist making violence into capitalist preserving policing to predispose further transactability and reproduction. It's a recursive feint of encasing legibility, operational violence, and what gets produced as facts on the ground, similar to what Aileen Morton Robinson calls the white possessive, and I love her definition of the white possessive. It's, quote, the process through which the materiality of significations, such as material building that really exists or material deed that I really hold in my hand, are perceived, we might say misperceived, as evidence of ownership by those who have taken possession already. Missing from Marx's analysis of the story of the worthy frugal elite and the disposable masses and the story of the conquest and theft turned into property and right, maybe because it goes without saying, is the police. To quote the title of an important book by Mark Neocloas, it is the function of the police to fabricate social order. Against the myth of a spontaneously generated civil society and the idea of the free market, Neocleus tracks security as the concept through which the state imposes order on civil society and organizes market conditions through police power, right? So policing, not as an institution, but an activity, not as an entity, but a function. Police power as administrative power writ large because it involves nothing less than, quote, securing the system of social domination, including racialized, gendered, and colonial class relations. 
to quote the 18th century police political theorist uh, Patrick Colquhan, quote, police is the constant and never failing attendant of the accumulation of wealth. The acceleration of wealth can only be achieved by establishing the correct system of police. So to understand this better uh, for contemporary neoliberal racial capitalism, I want to qu turn quickly to Ruth Wilson Gilmore. You guys know Ruthie's work, Ruth Wilson Gilmore's work, like Golden Gulags, right? So in Golden Gulag, uh, Gilmore examines the growth of a racialized prison economy in California in the 1980s and 90s and how it emerged as sort of a fix for surpluses of capital and land and labor and state capacity. And in other work, what Gilmore teaches us basically is that if capitalism requires inequality and racism enshrines the inequality capitalism requires, policing administrates, guarantees, produces, fabricates racial capitalist asymmetries of austerity to the point of killing. In an interview in The Guardian, right after the Baltimore uprising in response to the police murder of Freddie Gray in 2015, uh, Gilmore said something that I found really helpful and I thought about for a long time. I thought about it for a long time, in the shower, walking down the street, okay? So, and this is what I thought. It, could, it seemed so simple, but it, it, got, it got really deep, okay, I think. She gets deep really fast. So this is what she said. I think many people respond to these high profile police killings by thinking they can kill us because they can lock us up. But I think it goes the other way. They can lock us up because they know they can kill us. They can kill with impunity. In other words, we have to think deeper than processes of criminalization. They can kill us because they can lock us up, right? It's true, of course, mass criminalization of people of color leads to police killing. But Gilmore wants us to think deeper. They can lock us up because they know they can kill us, because they can kill with impunity. That is at the root of things, it's not only police power bound up with racialized criminalization, it's police power bound up with the fabrication of racial settler capitalist orders. Policing is the power to administrate capitalism to the point of killing with impunity. For Neocleus, the crux of the police function in 19th century England was to fabricate wage labor by policing the poor, and in particular, policing and thereby fabricating a line between poverty and the rabble between the merely poor, whose participation in wage labor marks them as moral and legitimate, and the indigent, whose economic inactivity or subsistence outside of the industrial class system mark them as immoral, idle, and unworthy. Right? Poverty can't be ab abolished, right? because that would abolish class society. So instead, the administrative project of the police for Neoclis is to, quote, prevent the poor from becoming rabble, to, quote, teach them the immorality of crime. Police are not citizens in uniform, but street administrators of the state protecting property and ownership who use their discretion, a concept I'll talk about more in a minute, to decide who is merely poor and who is criminally indigent. Can you guys still hear me back there? Have I gotten like slow or anything? Just keep going? Okay, okay, good. Thanks for the feedback. If we think about this task of policing as fabricating social order by policing the line between the legitimate and the illegitimate, the poor and the rabble for today's rising authoritarian neoliberalism, as structured by ongoing settler colonial dispossession, racial arbitrage, and heteropatriarchal routines, we see new complexities. Not only policing the poor of color, but policing the line between poverty and disposability, and policing lines of legitimacy and illegitimacy with enormous flexibility and fastness that is preemptive, pervasive, pervasive yet able to micro-target, operating through fusions of police, military, and private security, leaning more on commodifications of pacification across multiple scales and jurisdictions, and producing shifting yet modular categories of multi-criminalization. Chandan Reddy uh, gets at this in his discussion of assetless individuality as the right to be handled, as how people with at, out at assets, once individuated and fed into these administrative machines, become highly flexible, so that in one moment they be, can be coded as you know, wage labor. Uh, in another instant, they can be the raw material for prison warehousing. In another instant, worthy of credit baiting. And in another, indebted generators of fines and fees. Shannon Speed gives us another example in her book, States of Violence, uh, Indigenous Women Migrants in the Era of Neoliberal Multicriminalism. Speed argues that as states in the Americas become increasingly more authoritarian, neoliberal, and corrupt, and as the economy offered to the poor and the indigenous is increasingly one of illegality, 
Central American indigenous women migrants are interpreted multiply as criminals and different kinds of criminals, right? So Central American states interpolate them as poor peasants likely to commit criminal offenses related to poverty and subject them to colonial gendered violence. Mexico then interpolates them as potential drug traffickers <coughs> and non-citizens who can be blackmailed and worse. And in the US, they are recast from asylum seekers to terrorists and criminal aliens. Finally, in terms of discourses of neoliberal multicriminalization, I hate it, but we have to mention it, right? There's Trump's you know, constant delineating of who's illegitimate, who's an enemy of America, right? It's um, Muslims, it's refugees, it's African Americans, it's the media, it's Democrats, it's immigrants, it's Nancy Pelosi, it's Mexican nationals, it's political activists, right? Uh, it's all of us, right? It's all of us at some time. Um, so his constant ruling on the illegitimacy of groups for opportunistic deal making with white nationalists and other self-dealing. So what strikes me in terms of contemporary policing for authoritarian neoliberalism is the extension of racialized impunity for police killing as raw administrative police power. In the killing of Eric Garner for selling loose individual cigarettes, we can see police killing power used to punish the asset list for participating in a secondary economy. In fact, the most recently published police administration textbook uh, justifies Garner's killing by stating that sales of Lucy's in New York, quote, deprive the state and city of a combined $6.95 per pack. In Milwaukee, where I live, uh, the police killing of Dontre Hamilton for sleeping on a bench in front of a Starbucks can be seen as a defense of real estate financial capital with Dontre's sleeping body, like the bodies of asylum seekers itself being seen as an offense to authoritarian neoliberal capitalist orders. And then there's the fused ICE police relationship that allows pursuit to the point of killing that Rachel Buff calls the deportation terror. And we can tell that impunity is irreducible to police power as administrative power because whenever impunity is called into question, we get a fairy tale, right? We get a fairy tale like, I thought she had a gun. A fairy tale like, I feared for my life. A fairy tale, to quote US Attorney Richard Donahue, quote, there is nothing in the video to suggest that Officer Pantaleo intended or attempted to place Mr. Garner in a chokehold. Use of force standards like objective reasonableness and categories police use routinely in patrolling such as obstruction and reasonable suspicion are also fairy tale euphemisms for the exercise of police power. Impunity and its twin discretion are necessary for policing as political administration and they take on new weight as authoritarian neoliberal orders and their opportunistic modes of accumulation require flexibility, preemptive capabilities and deadly violence against rapidly shifting targets. Discretion gives police the operational power to structure every single encounter on the fly, to look the other way or pursue, to warn or arrest, to insert someone into the criminal justice apparatus of human sacrifice and impoverishment or not. Liberal law and order discourse often points to discernment as the weak point in policing, right? That that policeman acted in a biased way, that they made bad decisions, they went after the wrong person, they didn't follow procedures. But discretion is in fact not a weakness in policing, but the source of its operational strength. If there was more time, I'd like to think with you more about the relationship between police discretion and what Nikhil Singh calls the whiteness of police and what Daniel Hosang and Joseph Landes investigate as producer, patriot, masculinist identity formations. Basically, we need to think discretion outside of concepts of liberal individualism and individual calculation, because when we do that, police violence is individualized and we get the administrative trick of punishing the few bad apples, putting them on administrative duty, or making bad departments undergo retraining, which circularly reinforces the administrative power of the police. Rather, discretion is a way of fixing the structures of social domination durably in the experiential and lived dispositions of social subjects who in the case of the police are often socialized to act in accord with background conditions structured by structural masculinism, white supremacy, settler colonialism, nationalism, and anti-Arab and anti-immigrant racism. This means that the administration that the police function does on the fly to survey, to inform, repress, arrange things on the street, draw that line between poverty and disposability can be done with discretion in an instant in accord with all these background conditions, even as to the police it is enforcing law against moral offenders. Importantly, the discretion impunity continuum mirrors the law administration force continuum in that police action winds up determining what the law means, with judges continually deferring to police understandings and standard operating protocols in determining the scope of Fourth Amendment protections. Today, police impunity is taking on new dimensions with new modes of policing. For example, the fusion center and supply chain security represent complex new assemblages of police power, including local, state, and federal police, 
military, federal intelligence, corporations and corporate security, and global and local private security and criminal justice technologies, and all kinds of social police from emergency management personnel to workfare administrators. The assemblage, these assemblages achieve impunity through their administrative complexity itself and ambiguous jurisdictional claims and non-claims. Loosely organized around protecting critical infrastructure and enabled by anti-terrorism laws, fusion centers create the conditions of interoperability that enable neoliberal multicriminalization, yet as we have found out in, for example, the criminal persecution of Tiger Swan in the continuing no dapple activism, uh, they're subject only to be persecuted as individuals, right? Um, impunity also takes on new dimensions when increasingly administration is the punishment, policing is the punishment, right? We can think here of the trauma, illness, uh, killing, inducing administrative detention of asylum seekers, as well as the punishment of everyday life for black and brown, brown migrants under surveillance threats and other forms of administrative violence like deportation. We can also think about the ongoing social control of the colonial policing of American Indians and the anti-democratic discipline exerted through policing on economically exploited black communities such as Issa Kohler Hausman documents in misdemeanor land. Her study of how New York City's lower court criminal justice system has basically abandoned an adjudicative model of criminal law, like figuring out who's innocent and guilty, for a managerial model which imposes stigma, surveillance, and debility without formal conviction or punishment. All of this means that fighting, so this is a happy moment here, all of this means that fighting police killings, police impunity, and law enforcement discretion that is, that is the punishment, whether you're doing direct action or you are just living in the thickness of kinship, love, everyday grounded relationality, and the social more than human context that administrative power tries to deny, is part of living in revolutionary time, to use David Rodiger's language, of shaping a beautiful experiment, to quote Saidiya Hartman, or living in a good way, to use the colloquial from Indian country. Now we get to more depressing stuff and then some less depressing stuff again at the end because we're turning to the Trump administration, okay? And we might say that the Trump administration uses its rules and rulemaking like the police use use of force rules, which is to do what needs to be done, which is not individually determined, in order to enact transactability and to predispose the reproduction of further transactability. I will focus on how the Trump and the Koch Mercer arch conservative networks he subcontracts to are using administrative power right now to try to break the administrative state and institute a post civil service model of deal making governance. So on one level, the Trump administration is using uh, Trump is using executive administrative powers to make the same old deal of winning consent for capitalist rights by linking them to white supremacist, Christian, male prestige and favor, right? This deal making is done through executive orders and administrative actions that frontally attack the well-being and civil and human rights of legal and unauthorized immigrants, refugees, Muslims and Arabs, LGBTQ persons, American Indians and the poor of color. These attacks are done by executive order. I think of them as fascism by federal register. Um, and are so numerous that I could list them to you for hours, literally. But you know them, right? It's the Muslim bans, it's the attacks on DACA, it's the undermining of LGBTQ rights. In the last months, it's the proclamation to deny uh, naturalization to legal immigrants who um, uh, um, uh, could be considered, who, you know, who have used social services by saying they violated the public, public charge thing, or to not allow legal immigrants in who, unless they can prove that they have health insurance, right? It's this, the gutting of numbers of refugee admissions. There's a great group, civilrights.org, has a day-to-day -day list of these administrative orders and guidances and executive orders, and uh, it's, uh, it keeps a running tab, so check those out. On a second level, there is the self-dealing, the discretionary use of the office of the president for personal gain, including the business he generates for his hotels and clubs, all the emoluments issues that have to do with the 500 business entities which Trump has refused to divest or put in blind trust, and the more than 750 conflicts of interest concerns that the Sunlight Foundation has tracked. There's also that incredible amount of crony capitalist deal making for donors and other wealthy elites in the administration's favor. Again, I could list these endlessly, but one example, as reported in the May 2019 Public Citizen report, is that the National Association of Manufacturers under Trump has achieved more than 85% of their wish list of deregulation and won the delay or repeal of more than 130 consumer worker and environmental regulations. The third level of deal making I'll discuss is accelerating under Trump but has its roots in right wing conservative activism since the 1970s to end the remnants of the functioning New Deal or carceral civil rights administrative state one, 
by bringing it in line with the right-wing theory of the unitary executive, the theory that Article II of the Constitution gives the president power over every aspect of the executive branch and all federal agencies, so exactly like a king, but it's supposed to be like really, really democratic because he was elected, right? Okay, so that's all you need, that one guy to be elected, and he's in charge of everything because he's the one that people voted in. Um, number two, by defunctioning administrative agencies through personnel rules and shenanigans, and three, by weaponizing the regulatory machinery to force deals that leverage the power of the state. So not just get the state out of the way, but force deals that leverage the power of the state and public resources, including people's health, well-being, and freedoms for the gain of private, not necessarily domestic capitalist entities. And we can think about this just to throw out something like the war on California, right? The Trump administration's war on California. For our purposes, it is highly ironic that right-wing conservative attacks against the administrative state, the deep state, the swamp, the soul-killing domain of career bureaucrats, right? It in fact catches hold of something real about the insulated operational power of administration that insulates the state from democratizing movements. Uh, their accusations of overreach or unconstitutional delegation in a warped way acknowledge that federal administrative agencies exercise a power that is at once de facto legislative, adjudicatory, and executive. That agencies, the EPA, the Department of Education, the USDA, you name it, issue rules that are intended to have the power of law, that internal administrative law judges rule on complaints and conflicts, and that fine fees and other actions are enforced against violators of the agency rules. Yet in the name of restoring democracy, and individualism and the fairy tales again of constitutionalization and the separation of powers, the real aim is to break the civil service state. In other words, right wing attempts to kill the administrate both criticize and seize the operational powers of the administrative state, which liberals generally do not acknowledge. And the battle is really raging right now in administrative law. Um, I have learned a lot from administrative legal scholars about this, and I especially want to point to Gillian Metzger's 2017 Harvard Law Review article called 1930s Redo, The Administrative State Under Siege. Metzger tracks the long history of conservative resistance to administrative governments uh, that since the, New Deal state, uh, since the New Deal state and its constant reliance on a fairy tale of the separation of powers as what democracy means, even as we see right-wing activists continue to use every branch of government, the judicial, Congress, executive, also the academy, to disable redistributive and safeguarding administrative apparatuses. And it's really reaching ahead now at the Supreme Court. Well, I don't know how many of you are tracking this, right? Um, uh, where Alito has long been an advocate of unitary executive theory, where Thomas has long argued against modern day delegations of executive authority to agencies is unconstitutional, where Roberts recently wrote in a ruling that, quote, the dangers posed by the administrator cannot be dismissed, and where Gorsuch, the most extreme anti-administrative state justice, wants to immediately end delegation and make Congress impossibly responsible for everything agencies do, from regulating drugs to making land use decisions. As Justice Elena Kagan puts it, conservative activists are now, quote, working to, quote, overturn cases that have long been central to the federal government's ability to function properly, to protect consumers and keep people safe. And indeed, the Trump administration has already appointed 150 judges at the federal level, at, which constitutes about 25% of the federal judiciary, right? So a lot is going to continue Trump or not. In Congress, activist lawmakers have put forth a series of legislative proposals that would paralyze federal agencies, putting their work under a host of new procedural and analytical requirements. This includes the Separation of Powers Restoration Act, which would end judicial deferment to agencies' interpretations of their rules, the RAINS Act, regulations from the executive in need of scrutiny that would require all new economically significant regulations to be approved by both chambers of Congress, and the Regulatory Accountability Act that would replace normal regulatory procedures with a trial-like process called adversarial rulemaking. The point is none of these things would work, right? None of these, they just wouldn't work. They just wouldn't work. It's a way of, of making sure agencies don't work anymore. Meanwhile, the Trump administration has used executive power to dramatically denormalize and weaponize agencies for deal-making. It has appointed department heads who have either expressed hostil hostil hostility, hostility, that too, to the purpose of the agency, or long-term corporate lobbyists, like you guys know all these, Rick Perry at Energy, Betsy DeVos at Education, uh, Dave Bernard at, in, in, at Interior, and the newly famous Mick Mulvaney, who was at one time head of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. But what probably has been most effective, um, and if you have friends or family members who work in the federal service, you probably already know about this, 
right? But what has been most effective at hurting agencies has been Trump's work to demand, dismantle them at the level of personnel. By not filling positions, especially those that call for scientists or other professional expertise, finding ways to reclassify jobs so they can be occupied by political appointees rather than civil servants, cutting budgets, and particularly destructively, relocating agency after, ag after agency out of DC and fragmenting them, often without paying for relocation or having good plans to keep them working. And this has indeed already happened to the Bureau of Land Management and much of the USDA. And just this week, Senate Republicans proposed an act that would move 90% of cabinet level departments, including the Office of Management and Budget and the General Service Administration. And this is the cynicalness, right? It would move them out of DC, fragment them, split up families, make it impossible for them to do the work in the name of putting them in economically distressed neighborhoods to bring development and, well, into those neighborhoods, right? Especially pernicious is the Trump administration's attack on administrative law judges and administrative adjudicators who have been reclassified from employees to inferior officers, making it more easy for them to be fired and controlled by the president and politically appointed superiors, such as administrative law judges who make undesirable rulings can now just be fired, and actually the rulings can also be overturned by department heads. Um, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center, the goal is to, quote, transform immigration judges into deportation enforcers. And I want to talk just a little bit about Trump's use, I'm getting close to the end here, of the OIRA, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, as a good example of the aggressive use of administrative power for rollout authoritarian neoliberalism that preemptively disciplines and forcibly instrumentalizes administrative apparatus through deal making. And like, if this is meant to be boring, right? It's meant to sound boring and make you not want to think about it, but there's a lot of power happening here. So the OIRA is a sub-agency neutrally described as the central authority for executive review of regu regulations and approval of government information and statistical collection and practice. But in truth, since it started in the Reagan era, it's been a way for the executive branch to gatekeep every other agency, right, and the regulations they want to pass, and a way to uh, connect private uh, industry and corporate lobbyists, right, uh, to, to, the, to those agencies, a backdoor. Its chief mechanism of control up until the Trump administration was to subject all agency rules to cost-benefit analysis, which means many regulatory battles could be won just by monetizing everything and showing how expensive regulations would be to implement. To push back a little bit, Clinton and Obama tried to calculate something, that they did calculate something they called social benefit, right? So for um, carbon emissions, on health impacts, the Obama administration estimated that that would cost $33 per ton of carbon. The Trump administration knocked that down to $1, right, for no reason and with no science between it. And basically what the Trump administration has just started doing is no longer calculating benefits, only costs, only costs, right? One of the first things the Trump administration did in terms of executive orders was to uh, to begin turning the OIRA into a policing and enforcement mechanism by passing this genius executive order, right? Reducing regulation and controlling regulated costs, which is that for every two, for every one rule you want to pass regulation, EPA or USDA or whoever you are, you have to repeal two. And it has to be like budget neutral, right? That is like a lot of sense in that, right? Two for one, two for one rule. Um, and then he passed 13771, reducing regulation and controlling regulatory, uh, that was 1377 actually, enforcing the regulatory reform agenda, which mandated that every, every federal agency has to create a regulatory reform officer and task force whose everyday job it is, is to identify regulations that can be repealed. A third executive order promoting energy independence and economic growth boosted conditions for oil, gas, and energy industries, calling on all executive departments and agencies to review energy regulations and rescind those with burdensome economic impacts. So, so far, he's killed, his ORIA has killed 195 regulations, and how many think they have been passed? Zero? I mean, it kind of should be zero, right? Two, two, like somebody needed something to happen there. There are two, two of them passed. But this week, a new order having to do with regulations was passed that I think shows where things are going, right? This one was called Executive Order on Promoting Rule of Law, right? You always know something's in trouble when it's that. Executive Order Promoting Rule of Law Through Improved Agency Guidance Documents. So guidance documents are how agencies actually uh, take the rules that they've made, right, that are very like broad and provide guidance for how the rules actually mean, how can, you can implement them in your business, what the timelines are, right? They're really like the how to do it thing. Now this order says uh, that federal administrative agencies 
can no longer use guidance documents. Like they, can't be, they can't write anything in a guidance document that would be binding, which is just how federal agencies work, right? And it advances us towards substituting deal making for the administrative state by saying that anyone who might be affected by a regulation has to be told about it in advance so that their input can be solicited before it is written, right? So make the deal from the beginning, not just block the law, but like be involved in writing the regulation. So we, uh, so we, uh, we should be clear, right? Trump's chaos is a powerful means to an end, but breaking the administrative state has been and will continue to be the goal of right-wing conservative and libertarian activists who dominate the Republican Party. And they are already preparing for what comes next. In a white paper prepared for the Koch-funded George Mason Center for the Study of the Administrative State, actually entitled, and I saw this after I already used all this language, I promise, but it's a little spooky that it's the same language. This, this white paper was called The Deal-Making State, Executive Power in the Trump Administration. It's written by UC Berkeley professor of law, Stephen Davidoff Solomon, and Wharton School professor David Ziering, and it literally offered the Trump administration a blueprint for how to substitute deal-making for the administrative state, normalize it, and make it workable. Quoting from the white paper, Quote, the Trump administration has promised to pursue policy through deals with the private sector, not as an extraordinary response to extraordinary events, but as part and parcel of the ordinary work of government. Here, we, the authors, explore the ways the Trump administration can avoid ordinary administrative procedure by using private channels to meet policy goals. And in order to normalize this bid to reorient the state around deal making, they provide two examples of how it's been done already. It's already normal. And talk about like ordinary racial capitalist violence. Their first example that they just throw in, it's so stupid. Their first example is the Louisiana Purchase, right? That that was Thomas Jefferson's best thing he ever did, right? It was the best deal ever made. A uh, secret deal to purchase 800 million square miles of land from France, right? And then their other example is the quote unquote rescue of the financial system, 2006 to 2008, right? Through bespoke agreements with individual financial institutions. And they offer that example as proof that like, even though this might sound a little scary to change everything and make it about making deals, hey, that was good for social welfare, wasn't it? Right, that deal making that would happen. So we should just do that all the time, right? We should figure out how to rule by deal in non-crisis times such that, as they say, transactional governance can become a way of life. Though they acknowledge that deal-making governance might, not be, might be seen as an erosion of democratic norms, they lay down the gauntlet by saying, well, whether you like it or not, it has to do with your feeling about the ossified administrative state. And anyway, they have workable problems you know, for issues like transparency and accountability. Uh, their modus operandi would be, quote, a legal arrangement negotiated by sophisticated outside lawyers acting in the government's interest to meet the problems of the transactional approach. So the sophisticated lawyers will take care of it, right? Transparency issues, well, we'll put it in the Office of Management and Budget. And from there, if you want to find out about any deal making that's going on, you could, you could do a Freedom of Information Act and just see what's going on, right? Um, and then uh, the other thing is that uh, in order to make sure that parties who are unhappy with government deal making uh, have their day in court, we got to make sure that people can sue if they don't like the deals that were made. So their plan for lawyered governance led by a deal maker in chief is obviously a really stunning example of insulating state capitalist transactability from even the already insulated processes of the nation state, requiring only a bevy of lawyers rather than three million federal civil servants. So clearly the current impeachment inquiry arises out of conducting foreign policy as deal making. And it is heartening to see the administration's malfeasance exposed by civil service professionals. And that has been the story, right? The administrative state Trump has worked so hard to break might be his undoing. But as is clear from the barely lawyered letter to Nancy Pelosi stating his non-cooperation with an illegitimate impeachment inquiry, the Trump administration's real power is his political base held together by whiteness, masculinism, patriotism, and resentment. People who see themselves as the only legitimate US citizens and the betrayal of Trump as the betrayal of themselves and the nation. And clearly a return to the more normal neoliberal or even carceral civil rights administrative state, the management of so-called democratic racial and settler capitalism for 15% of people or 30% of people rather than 0.1% is not justice or democracy. We can take heart in remembering that authoritarian neoliberalism is weak in part because it doesn't exist like it claims to exist. It enforces appearances of transactability that are not real. In the same sense, the diversities of social production are real and alternate modes of collectivity strengthen and continue to circulate. Resistance to old and new neoliberalisms is everywhere and we are seeing it on the streets of Hong Kong, 
Lebanon, Chile, Haiti, Catalonia, Iraq, and Palestine were demands for a good life and new post-sectarian politics beyond the formulas and strangled capacities of neoliberal states are really being called for loudly. Across the US, powerful collectives of solidarities are developing under so many names, Black Lives Matter, Communities Not Cages, Never Again Is Now, and I am certain that Chandan Reddy, when he gives his talk in a few weeks, will be talking about how in the US the most vital social movement groups working on race, indigeneity, migrancy, and poverty are being led by the very activists and predominantly queer women of color who have longed works against administrative violence, administrative controls, in public assistance, in immigration, in corrections. I hope that by identifying how administrative power makes the violence required for racial colonial capitalist accumulation appear ordinary, we can see resistance beyond the usual elitism of our politics of political knowledge because it's not, I think, in the end, programmatic politics that defeats administrated discretion and impunity and abstraction and reduction, but interdependence grounded relationality, deep context, and attunement to materializing social process by living not as an individuated unit in the recursive teleology of administrative time, but collectively in the open future anteriority of everyday revolutionary time. Thank you guys for your patience. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So new work, love any thoughts and feelings. I also really like doing Q&A as discussions, right? So um, feel free to talk to each other if you hear somebody talking about something you're interested in. Um, uh, applying it to your work, any, anything like that would be great. But I would love, love to hear some thoughts. And I would love to drink a little water too. So please take your time. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank you for coming on Halloween. I know, I know, I feel really grateful. Thank you. I'll, I'll start things off. Thank you. Not by no means an um, encompassing question. As you were talking, I was getting, um, you know, starting to feel more and more I know. horrified. <laughs> <laughs> I I'm back. sorry. No, 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 I mean, in a, in a good way. Okay. And I was thinking back to how the outrage of when we first knew about Blackwater and privatized yeah. uh, military mercenaries mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the idea that you know waging private wars without any yeah. oversight um, yeah. was so horrifying. And then I was you know then thinking about Daryl Lee's work about you know these private um, you know migrate. Uh, or utilization of migrant labor yeah. Um, yeah. to staff these private bases mm -mm, with mm -mm, private mercenary mm -mm. armies yeah. and how horrifying that was. Yeah, and I feel like, that is horrifying. But, but, but what I was reflecting on is you're pointing to something more deeply horrifying, or not more, <laughs> but additionally horrifying. And um, so, <laughs> um, I, so my, my question is, yeah. um, you're, you're, you switched from speaking of administrative power mm. to the administrative state. state. I know I did that. And, yeah. No, no, no. But mm. I think Im, importantly, I mean, mm -mm -mm. It, it's it an example of it. So much about what mm -hmm. we're in right now. Thank you. And um, so I was just wondering if you could speak about that transition. Yeah. And the ways in which, um, I mean, in a sense, what you're describing under Trump is the, um, how did you put it, both the dismantling and the seizing of different agencies, yeah. different apparatuses, yeah. um, in order to right. shore up executive authority or authoritarian neoliberalism yeah. in different yeah. ways. So administrative power is a particular kind of, as you said, how or a property. Yeah. A, yeah. Uh, a form of governance and yeah. management. Yeah. But the administrative state is something else. So I, just I know. Talk about I know. That. I mean, I guess I mean one is the example. Is, is it like we need to think about administrative power in general, and then we need to think about it in the state. But I mean, we also have to think about how all of the administrative apparatuses that existed even before they were like being hollowed out are still problematic, 
right? Like meritocracy and professionalism. You know, I mean, the, the things that we bemoan the end of, and we really genuinely bemoan the end of them, are also uh, barriers. They're regulators. They're uh, modes of, again, seeing who's legitimate and who's illegitimate, right? They're, they're, uh, they, they also kind of insulate the state from having to deal with the economic violence it produces, right, in various ways. Um, so, so there's like the Trump version of it. There's the thinking about the problem of administrative apparatuses already. You guys all know the critique of the New Deal state, right? Um, but I guess then I want to think like we need to just like the, the whole way that democratic process has been taken for allowing capitalist violence to kind of continue, right, administrative process, to let it be unknown and to let it be made ordinary. I, I want it to not be made ordinary, and I want that to be recognized, right? Like it's not law happening neutrally, right? It's not professionals deciding who gets student financial aid money and who doesn't, right? I mean, there is that, but that's reproducing uh, class mobility for some and possibilities of entrance into class mobility for others, and that's not, you know, taking social process together and deciding where we want to take our ability to make things happen, right? So there's something about wanting to, I guess, is this a nihilistic desire? Is it a creative desire, right? But it's something about saying this ordinary making, doing the unknowing thing, because it's easy to do, it's how the structures are set up, rather than like, okay, let's think about how we're all here now and we're in the city and we're in this place and we're interdependent on each other and we're interdependent with the earth and you know, my ability to breathe is dependent and to like, survive is dependent on you guys in various ways. And the context it goes so much deeper, right? That you can't, you can't stop it where the state stops it as like that was a public policy decision out of the question, right? We need really new context rich, complex personality, modes of understanding ourselves as collective, right? That take the injustices of the past that are whitewashed through things like inherited, inherited wealth, et cetera, and just like radically make them available for um, relating to each other through them in ways that are fair. And how does that happen? I don't know, right? I mean, I do think that like one of the things that's scary for me uh, is that I do think the administrative state is going. I think that it's becoming this executive wielding deal-making thing. Um, but I don't think going back to it would be oh, like, I, like good or possible, right, in some ways. And it, it's, like, it's like we can't be separated from what's going on in Lebanon now or Palestine because the elites aren't separated. You know what I mean? They're using the same technologies of control and policing. And there has to be a way of feeling interdependent people power beyond nation state boundaries. You know what I mean? I mean, it's like very utopic and nihilistic together. But I also think that it's kind of happening, right? It's like people are reflecting and like, like, the Sacklers, you know, like it used to be when I was growing up in the university, right? It was like the fact that you could like know who your board members were and try to kick them out and criticize them. The idea that they could do things with impunity because they were the ones who knew and they had all the facts, blah, blah. I think that's over. I think the day of non-transparent boards is like dying. And I think that's a really, that's a really good thing, right? For individual institutions, right? Like we want to know who's on our board. We want to, you know, know what they're doing. We want to be involved in that. So. That's my response. <laughs> okay. So there's so many like, just rich things. I mean, but I, I like also just so appreciate like all the ways you're calling your attention to the quotidian operation of the state as this like really important thing. But so here's just a couple of questions. So the, <laughs> yeah. the, the part on um, the like in the last third about mm -hmm. um, the, all these ways the administrative state is changing. That seems a little more familiar about a kind of like libertarian agenda about just yes. deregulation, yes. a little more unitary. Mm -hmm. yeah. The part about the police as serving the interest of capital does seem to presume that there is a singular interest of capital mm. and its relationship to accumulation mm. that can be realized through a mm. set of practices. And capital at this moment seems more contradictory and, right. you know, like it, it doesn't have to shit right. together in the, right. in, this, in the way that that might suggest. So when I think, for example, about like tariffs, about environmental regulation, mm -hmm. where there actually are splits and there's no singular sense yeah. of what its relationship is yeah. to managing people yeah. to reproduce the conditions of accumulation. And the second part is I'm thinking about these kind of low-level criminal justice reforms that are all about like ending mm -hmm. cash bail. Right, those right. Those are actually good. about kind of trying yeah. to loosen up a little bit yeah, yeah, yeah. the function of regulation. Yeah. You know, that is a really good, so I guess I wonder good how thing going on. think about that yeah. um, as being, you know, because when I think about like 
you know, in the 90s, like during like stop and frisk and, and its relationship with mm. gentrification, mm. that seems to be a very, right, like one to one correspondence. Yeah. Where yeah. It's like certain yeah. particular yeah. interests. But yeah. this seems a little less, you know, a little less, like, well, more chaotic. So, but, I mean, I do think it's more chaotic. I think I did a bad job of trying to say what I want to say. Um, which because I don't think it's connected to like one formation of you know sedimented out as the momentarily dominant capitalization. I think that we're in a period now where accumulation happens fast, opportunistically. You need the police to do this at one time and that at another time, right? So I think that there's there's something about taking police power and spreading it everywhere, right? So that um, you know uh, like uh, one day you might need this you know river head. Um, policed and the people who are like, like pacify the people who are trying to stop it from being developed, right? And another time you might need uh, uh, this downtown area cleared out. I mean, I think what I, what I miss talking about is sort of how policing is responsive to resistance, right? And how it's tracking that around. But I, I'm trying to get at something about the need to, what police do to adjudicate on the ground conditions for a really fast, opportunistic deal-making kind of capitalism, right? That's like, now this, this part is open, now this part is closed, now we need to send the police to California to make emissions, you know, to like uh, police uh, cars to make sure they give out more emissions. You know what I mean? Like our, you know, or like your border patrol guard this moment, now your private uh, corporate poli poor policing the poor, right? Of course, it's a really profound thing. But there's, there's something about the speed, interoperability, lack of accountability, the need for coercive apparatuses to be that net, right? Um, that I think I need to, you know, I'm still doing new writing. I need to find better examples and I need to write, like, give some more concrete examples of these fusions, right? You guys all know about fusion centers, right? Um, that bring together, they're, they're really bad, right? They don't actually predict any kind of crime and stop crime usually, but they send a lot of information to a lot of places, right? So they send the FBI and the military and the local police and then like hospital records, right? All can be put in the central part um, and then um, activists can be picked out from it, like that, like that sort of thing. And, and like the ACLU is constantly saying this is the problem with fusion centers, right? They bring military into policing. They are unaccountable, right? They have this administrative complexity that makes them unaccountable. They gather tons of information so they're violating uh, civil rights, but they had to sign a waiver saying they wouldn't violate anybody's civil rights. So there you go, it's all good. Anyway, there's a lot of that like certifying that to me is another form of administrative violence, right? Like we signed the waiver, you know, nothing could happen. But that, that's exactly what makes them powerful. Right? So it's that, that kind of expansion like that I'm trying to catch a hold of with interoperability, but uh, I'm, not, I'm not there yet. And I do think that it's hard because it's a fast, fast, opportunistic making, crisis managing kind of time, right? With this extractive logistical, financialize this, abandon it, now extract from it, you know what I mean? Um, so I, I, need, I need better examples. Point but, well taken. But is there a way in which um, there's administrative inefficiency too that isn't totally. just uh, you know, geared towards functioning Yes. Everything for mm -hmm. yes. capital relations. For repression. I mean, yes. Do you know what I mean? There's, there's yes. a kind of um, Medusa like yes. quality to what you're describing. I know. That isn't yeah. capturing the pushback and right. the struggle. That'll be in the next part, right? Because I, I, I do think that is really true, right? Because at other times I've tried to talk about this with the help of a colleague named Lisa Kecho as a kind of power that is like glass, right? That it kind of believes in its own inevitable, you know, invisible inevitability and it's sort of like, like glass and that you don't see, like it tries to be a kind of power that you don't see, you just kind of see through, you don't notice. But in fact, it's actually really vulnerable to shattering, right? Because it, 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 it never works like, it says it's going to work, right? These are the lies, right? The lies of how things are supposed to work. The li and like human, to anything that has to go through human beings is much more variable, is, you know, like, a, a, is always resisted all the time. Um, you can't, you know, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not how human beings live their lives in relation to each other, right? And and kind of there isn't an um, omniscience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There isn't an omniscience. No, no, there isn't. I mean, anyone who's gone to Palestine knows the idea that they're going to stop everybody from getting, you know, getting in. Yeah, it's not, it's not omniscient at all, right? There's a lot of waste and no omniscience. And yet, it's not. I mean, I guess the, then the like, but it's it's uh, it's still not something that normal politics, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. is getting a hold mm -hmm. on, right? So it's yeah. more like on the streets resistance, social movement resistance, living lives resistance. And I guess it's just another version of like 
you know, something that is controlling kind of normal politics in a way that we need to kind of step over mm -hmm. and go around, right? In terms of like making life together, oh. you know. Seems to have overcome normal politics. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, 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 say, say that. That's I'm very important. I'm sitting in the first row, so I can't see what I'm <laughs> No, but you were saying it seems like it overcomes. It's administrative yeah, please, everybody. has overcome normal politics. Yeah. I mean, it does feel, that's though. That's what you Do you guys feel that? Yeah. Do you, well, that's or, what you're describing. It is yeah. what I was describing. <laughs> <laughs> but do you think it's true? Do you think it's true, or do you think it's overstated? Or do you feel like, you know, there's something, there's some other categorical way we need to think about it? Yes. Maybe, maybe um, first I really love this talk and I think it's you know, just amazing and um, I really, I, I wanna kind of build on what Danny and Lisa were asking you, mm -hmm. um, which is that this is a talk that's really looking at, um, at capital's perspective of mm -hmm. administrative power yes. and, um, and we might reorient it as well from um, from those who are affected by administrative mm -hmm. powers relationship to that's the light glass part. So right. those who are affected right. um, can actually see the lie all the time. Right. That's um, like the Sadia Hartman wayward lives beautiful experiment. Right. And and so that's so, the other part. Yes, the other part. Yes, but you yes, but and, and this is and this is just to to build on this question of um, how how it breaks normal politics and maybe have you elaborate on it, which is you know, I, I wonder if if we take the example of Ferguson um, or Eric Gardner in the informal economy, um, where survival economies or subsist uh, various forms of um, you know, multi-job economies um, produce the means of living, then what we're talking about is a particular way in which poverty capital is being created, you know, sort of Ananya Roy's notion, mm -hmm. um, and the degree to which um, poverty capital is administrated. Um, and it would be the difference between, in Neoclis's account, you know, something like the, the poor who might still become as a reserve army of labor for the working class, mm -hmm. and and the brown, and, and I can't remember what the name was for the other side of the indigenous, the, the, the rabble, the rabble, yeah. you know, um, and it and and that division, of course, is a racial division in our mm -hmm. in our in our world, mm -hmm. um, and and so when you when administrative power is operationalizing you know, the kind of poverty capital making out of the, um, out of the rabble. I think that that's one example where um, we have what you were talking about in the beginning of your talk, which is um, it's a part of its effectivity is that people don't have the language to mm. describe its violation in the terms of liberal political idioms. Um, and in and in the public sphere, nice. so so I think of all the people you know who are organizing in in um, uh, Ferguson who would make analogies to slavery, mm -hmm. and they'd say that this was a modern day slavery, and people said, oh, you know, you're really misunderstanding mm -hmm, what's going mm -hmm, on here mm -hmm. and so forth. But what they were capturing was that from their perspective capital making is violence making mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and there is no idiom for that in political life mm -hmm. um, there's only you know legal and illegal you know um, uh, mm -hmm. legitimate and illegitimate and so on and so I really appreciate your sense that part of what's what is effective about this is that it creates modes mm -hmm. of, uh, uh, of enactment for which the resistance has um, its genealogy is in the long black radical tradition, or its right. genealogy is in the is in precisely the um, subaltern movements mm -hmm. um, that have been foreclosed from um, the national public sphere. Do you know? Yeah, that, that's very helpful. And why the you know the normal political language doesn't get us there, right? Yeah. Like kinship or jubilee <laughs> or anti-slavery or abolition, right? Is the term yeah. that gets us yes. there. Abolition, yeah. yeah. Yes. It's a, I'm sorry? It's a bit of a half baked question, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about another form of deal making. Ah, um, okay. By which I have um, Trump's letter to the Turkish president Erdogan. Ha 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 ha. Yes. It starts with, let's make a good deal. Oh, <laughs> yes. And I, I was, so, and I was thinking about that in terms of, like, I um, talked to my students about it um, as it came out, because to me it's like, um, it's such a striking moment of 
the exposure of someone saying the unsayable, mm -hmm. which is, I will destroy your economy. Mm -hmm. That's something you're not supposed to say. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's supposed to know it, but you're not supposed to say it. And I was thinking, isn't it interesting that huh. this, is, this is a moment in which everything like, is actually exposed. Like yeah, I do. And, and then I was thinking in terms of like, so like his call, I think he says, let's make a deal twice in that very short letter. And, and I was thinking like, maybe that has always been. Mm -hmm. right? You're making a deal. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if there is a yeah. way in which a very particular transnational mm -hmm. um, kind of like criminality <laughs> of their deal making is now seeping into the national yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. a little bit. Maybe like this was how things were done yeah. in certain spheres yeah. always already. I mean, I think like, that there were more elites who agreed with what was going on. Right, there's a wider political ruling class, right? Like Hunter Biden, right? What he did was, you know, a kind of like he was sitting on a board because his father was vice president and it was legal, right? But, uh, but there was a whole group of political, did I, did I, sorry. Okay, like, you know, like the political class accepted that, right? The way that lobbying worked in that way, right? That that was like accepted because a lot of people got to be part of it, right? And now it does seem like it's this more narrow, like fight within the ruling class, right? Um, uh, and we get an exposure of something that was basically happening all along, but it's happening now in a more authoritarian, direct, you know, sort of like plutocratic way. Um, yeah, yeah, I think it is a time of exposure, right, of a lot of things. Does, what do you think about that? Does that, like, give you hope, or do you want, like, you know what I mean? Like, uh, just any thoughts you have on it? I mean, I don't know. I think that it's, like, even though it's depressing, I'd rather have all of the ugliness be exposed yeah. for what it is yeah. than not. I, yeah. but I, I, don't, I don't necessarily, I don't think of it as better or worse. It is where it's going. Yeah. But I think it's interesting yeah. that there is yeah. a shift to like, yeah. I mean, the power relationships between U.S. and Turkey have not changed. Mm -hmm. Nobody needs to say, I mm -hmm. will destroy your economy, remember the past year Brexit right. incident. Like, it's funny that this is now being said, ha, ha, ha. and nobody, it is what has been known, but mm -hmm. now it's okay to articulate it. And that's, I think, an interesting change. It is like, very interesting. It's a, it's a threat. Some cover I mean, is as, off. As, as a very basic threat that you didn't have to make because it was always already understood. Mm -mm -mm. And so, yeah. Really good question. Anybody else want to respond to that? Any thoughts about that? Really good thoughts. Yeah. Um, I have a question. If it's from that, it pushes on what you said. Yeah, about sure. The first question. Um, it seems to me that the story you're telling is sort of one of the story of a new right. Mm. In the sense that you're talking, mm -hmm. you're, you're presenting a story that's sort of a, one of a kind of implicit uh, critique of bureaucracy mm -hmm. and transition from that into at least a critique of public bureaucracy, mm -hmm. into one mm -hmm. which we're going into neoliberalism, mm -hmm. consolidation of private bureaucracies. But then we even go beyond that towards mm -hmm. the deal. The deal, yeah. The administrator as the deal maker. Mm -hmm. And this sort of seems to touch on your point. Um, you mentioned fascism once, twice. Um, fascism in the sense of if we see it as a fascism that's based on uh, this kind of uh, romantic, romantic sort of, of doing. Mm -hmm. which is such, so mm -hmm. a, Very true. A masculine yeah. view of doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I guess what, what I'm asking is, especially thinking of this in the terms of the new right, mm -hmm. um, and thinking of the new right simultaneously arising in terms of the new left, mm -hmm. I'm wondering um, what are the thinking especially in this in terms of the vocabulary of racial capitalism, mm -hmm. what are the anti-racist, anti-capitalist politics that come out of this? Because yeah. I, want, I wanted to push a little bit further beyond transparency. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What does that look like? And the reason why I also mentioned that you left is, I don't, uh, listening to your talk, I, I think there's almost no coincidence that Foucault and Deleuze are actually speaking in terms of fascism within, mm -hmm. within one's head. Mm -hmm. um, it seems mm -hmm. maybe a little out of place at times in mm -hmm. terms of where that's going, but it seems like there's a through line with that. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, what are the politics that come out of this? What are the politics that come out of this? Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, right? Because 
I, I tried to address it a little bit at the end, and I know I didn't do it satisfactorily, and I need a lot more time to do it satisfactorily, but it is a politics that makes us leave our usual, like, it might not be recognized as a politics anymore, right? So the words, I tried to talk about words like interdependence and grander relationality, which is coming out of indigenous studies, which is the idea that we do solidarity to each other by developing kind of obligations, land-based, a sense of land agential, and like how do we share this land in a way that's good for all of us, right? So it's coming out of not liberal frameworks anymore. So it doesn't sound political in the same way anymore. It's coming out like another phrase that just comes to my mind. These things feel real, right? When you're in the moment of like doing direct action, when you're in the moment of doing guest host relationships with people you're supposed to be separated from, right? Like a Jew in Palestine, right? In the West Bank or something. Um, and they feel like guest host relationships, they feel like kinship. They feel like building the strong connections and networks so that the abstractions um, and partitions don't divide us anymore, right? So that we know each other's full context and we, you know, like, like uh, uh, laugh at the attempt to administrate us as enemies to each other. You know what I mean? So it's a very weird, people-based kind of politics. It's a very like two-speed kind of politics, like a direct action kind of politics, but also like a speed of like learning, reading, knowing more than we can know, knowing more than the critique, right? And that's always gonna be hard. Like uh, uh, knowing not just what's wrong, but knowing the other thing that's going on, right? And so it's hard to stand in the classroom and talk about that other thing, right? I can talk about my communities of learning from indigenous communities in Wisconsin, right? And how I learned that like, even though they were supposed to be terminated, they were nothing like terminated. You know what I mean? And that even though they're forests, they're supposed to be their source of income. They're much more than that. You know what I mean? Or other communities that, you know, are my communities of learning. But it, to bring this in, to bring it in here as a politics feels like I can just gesture towards it, but it feels like, uh, it's like you gotta be, you gotta, be in it together, which is not, a, it's not programmatic in any way, right? It's like developing habits of interdependency, seeing the lie, not participating in the unknowing, fighting for complex personhood, you know what I mean? It's about empowerment of non-empowered communities. I mean, it's about like, it's, it's like a big thing. Is that, you know what I mean? It's, you know, is it DSA? <laughs> I mean, I, <laughs> I can't say that. I can't give you a presidential candidate. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, yeah, did you have a thought? Uh, yeah, I think I can um, I just wanted to know more about your thoughts on um, how your work and your research is kind of, or this moment is kind of intersecting with digital technology and media. And by which I mean, yeah. I think there seems to be an interesting, um, I wonder if there's an interesting thing about the joining or the uh, merging of digital and analog technology, especially hmm. Mm -hmm. I just kept felt, feeling myself during the talk, like, oh yeah, like that could happen, that deal making could happen in the mm. of space between digital and analog, or that um, totally. kind of rigidity versus the pliability of politics on both sides happens mm. in that So I don't know if there's a way you've reflected on that. I haven't, but it sounds great. I mean, it sounds like a very rich, a rich vein to think about. Yeah, uh, there's a a book about to come out called uh, Digitize and Punish mm -hmm. by Brian Jordan Jefferson that gives the full history of criminal justice technologies like from the 50s to now and the kinds of operabilities that they uh, make possible but also how they can be fought, right? Like fighting databases is something people are doing all the time, right? Um, and that's, that seems really necessary and exciting, right? So yeah. I want to hear more. Work on that and send it to me. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Really smart, <laughs> But I was actually, I, I want to hear this from you, perhaps, and this is perhaps to do it in a different way uh, to speak more about it. But in terms of looking at the genealogy of what you call worldwide, deep making of things, I mean, it seemed to me that when you were talking, so mm -hmm. you know, I know, right? I knew you were going to say that. Yeah, yeah. The same game, the local elites, to watch, you know, purchasing rights for oil, purchasing rights for Totally. So to me, in that sense, like, I give you for diplomacy. Yes. Yeah. Well, this is not how good it is. Diplomacy came out of the US. Yes. I completely agree. It is colonialism. 
I mean, it is, the capitalism is always colonialism, right? <laughs> Liberalism comes out of colonialism. Absolutely. So, you know, it is, of course, nothing new under the sun. I think the thing that is new is the attempt to really kill these, the normal way that the administrative agencies have functioned, right? To, like, really make sure there's nothing in the way of, like, oil, gas, deal-making, right? And that, that it's enforced in certain ways. But the general thing, right? Capitalism does work through deal-making. We've got the Louisiana Purchase. We've got, like, the coloniality, like, colonialism. It is colonialism, right? Like, and that's interesting to me. Right, which is like what, like, like we are, like the colonialism was never not in the nation state, right, at any time. Um, how do we talk about, like, the colonialism that was the high period of the nation state in the West, right? They, like, we often talk about them as imperial states, but it feels like it was always more than that, too, that they were also always colonial, right? Uh, and I, I feel like tracing those modes, right, uh, uh, is really, it's really like the, the, the Tracing those modes through jurisdiction making, right? Thinking, especially in settler colonial societies, like maybe seeing how that works in settler colonial societies is something that can tell us more about how it worked more generally. I think it's something that I think some folks are doing in indigenous uh, legal stuff, and that I think I think we we need to do a lot more because you're right, it's colonialism. It is indeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a that kind of follows up on that a little bit. Yeah. Right. Um, because I was thinking, you know, some of these agencies, right, particularly at different moments, mm -hmm. are experiencing a kind of grounded relationality that challenges mm -hmm. some of the mandates that they are mm -hmm. charged with. Yes, and yeah. How some of those yeah. Um, kind of uh, moments of pushing back against yeah. the administrative apparatus. Yeah, we're has seeing in that. some ways, like, moved, maybe in some ways, the, this uh, mo moved us into a moment where the authoritarian becomes necessary hmm. because of like, that resistance. Yeah, yeah. These agencies yeah. that are yeah. willing to participate in, like yeah. the Social Security Administration being right. required to right. Um, uh, right. administer Police. legal status. Exactly. Right? Like, that's not something that they ever envisioned. Yeah, as yeah, yeah. And push back yeah. until you yeah. Know. Yeah. See, there's uh, exciting parts of that destruction happening. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and it is happening at, at different levels, right? Uh, of governance, like, I mean, states are where, state houses is where there was the resistance at first and also like the cunning capture of using rules to, you know, push through different um, uh, uh, gerrymandered districts or different kinds of powers that legislatures that have a, major, a Republican majority use to now keep themselves, right? Just really not pretending that democracy was in the rules and there was any different between them, just using the power of rules, but always then hitting on more resistance, right? Like teacher, the wildcat strikes of teachers. I mean, another way to talk about this would be that like all of this incredible, not just resistance, but new relationships and new ways of people living together, right? Is happening all at the same time, you know? So yeah, like it's a, the, 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 uh, the resistance part is very exciting and maybe one can and should start there so we don't get like feel depressed. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm kind of like, I've been told that, you know, I'm better at the recitation of oppression than I am at the rehearsal for freedom part. But I get there. I get there eventually. It's, but my brain doesn't start there. I, I kind of wish it did. I just wanted to take you back to that fantastic reading of the Mars. Um, oh, yeah. OK. So one of the things I thought was really, really um, enthralling about how you write was that bit about how you kind of took us through two different critiques at mm. once, one mm -hmm. around genre mm -hmm. and one Very around uh, the political economy. And so, so the, the kind of the element of the storytelling, how that kind of epic, sto uh, mm -hmm. hyper-moralizing, mm -hmm. kind of metaphysical storytelling about the meaning right. of uh, the real being always moral and always dividing us in two groups. So I was thinking if we can bring that back and hmm. add on hmm. to, hmm. so I can see two genres, hmm. the okay. potential between two genres, <laughs> we'll talk about the, the way administrative power talks about itself, which tries very deliberately to bore us to death. Yes. Make us not interested with yes. these terrible sounding, really long, soul destroying titles. But on the other hand, the epic story of, of the epic story of a new kind of anti hero uh, in Trump. So there are in this hyper spectral spectral there's the spectacle of Trump. 
Um, so on the one hand, the really dry form and the really dry genre of the ministry force, together with this really enthralling one headline a day, mm -hmm. what's going to happen next? Mm -hmm. Interesting. TVs, interesting. Right. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Like an interesting genre. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mix. Yeah, effective, right? Or do they work together yeah. as well? I'd like you that's, to, yeah. That's very helpful. No, I want to keep thinking about that. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think I have an immediate response other than that sounds right. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. Do you have thoughts beyond that? Like, no, I just find you really yeah, yeah. mind-boggling. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I guess that's sort of the end is like, like not being lulled by the non-story and seeing it as a lie. You know what I mean? Something like that would be, yeah. Yeah, like the power of the fairy tale. Producing depression and antidepressants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you guys. I mean, honestly, thank you. This is brand new off the brain, so you've given me lots to think about. And as I rework this over the next months, it'll, this is really will be helpful. So I'm really grateful to each and every one of you for listening and coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.